Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'd like to welcome all of you to another eventful night at the College of Complexes. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Second, we have a, uh, our speaker will speak up to an hour or thereabouts. Third, we will have a question and answer period. We ask that you ask questions during the question yeah. and answer period because after that, you, all of you will get a chance to rebut the speaker, whether on or off subject. Again, I'd like to welcome everybody. The College of Complexes has two simple rules. One is one fool at a time, and two is no personal attacks. We have a speaker tonight. His name is uh, Seth Cohen, and he's going to be talking about the history of freedom from the beginning of evolution to the present day. You can have it. Let's all of us welcome with a rousing round of applause, Seth Cohen. Okay. Uh, history. Freedom and liberty is one of our favorite topics. But what are they? Some philosophers say we are born in freedom, but that hardly seems likely. We are born with a clean slate, and we are what our social and physical environment makes us. Let us look back how we evolved from the animal kingdom. Somewhere in southern Africa, there was a drought that made the anthropoid apes come down from the trees. Their usual gait was that sometimes they walked on all four limbs, but once in a while they walked on two limbs. Hunting for food, they had to grab with their upper limbs. When they were in the trees, there was a division of labor between the upper limbs and the lower limbs, grabbing with their upper limbs to swing from tree to tree and eating with their upper limbs. So the upper limbs became like hands. With this hand, they learned to make tools, to cut meat, and after a long period of time, learn how to make spears. They were on their way to becoming homo sapiens, humans. From grunts, they developed speech because the need had come to communicate. Because to develop tools, they needed speech. Humans are basically tool makers. With tools, we evolved from simple tools to the Hubble space, uh, space Telescope. In this process, we gain freedom and liberty, a better understanding of the laws of nature and ourselves. We, we are part of nature. From hands, from bands of humans, we were hunters and gatherers. We developed into tribes like the American Indians or the German or Greek tribes or the Romans under Romulus who formed the civilization of the city-state of Rome. Or the Incas or the South Americans were able to diverse rivers and perform brain surgery. Even though they had not developed into a civilization, but civilization was a two-edged sword. It developed into classes, but the patrician, the patrician class and the slave class 
and a higher level of knowledge. But people like Cicero in ancient Greece, Plato, Democritus, Seneca, Lucreus, Heraclitus, with this knowledge they were able to build a great city-state and progress came. But with progress, the other side of the coin also came, slavery, where the human being became chattel, human animal. The Romans called the slaves tools with a voice. And with slavery came revolts. Spartacus, who led a slave revolt, was to last at four years. After slavery came feudalism with the aristocracy, which became the ruling class, with its kings and nobles and lords of the lords of the manor and the serfs who tilled and worked the land, and the lords got all all the benefits. But the serfs were a, bit, a little bit better off under serfdom, so there was progress to a certain degree. And with serf came, serfdom came the Dark Ages with its superstition and dogmas. <laughs> Civilization had advanced, but the discovery of the Americas in 1492 became the starting for point for the end of the Dark Ages. And the beginning of mercantilism or capitalism. More ships were needed, settlements were made in the New World, the need for sails, compasses, more craftsmen to make the ships, clothing, furniture, more wood, in the word, manufacturing. And capitalism comes into being with its means of production, <coughs> the guild under feudalism turns into a factory under capitalism. And with it, the modern proletariat, the worker. They come from the, from the manor, from the guild. Feudalism is overturned in France with its slogans of freedom. But, it, it, but is the worker really free? Is she or, or he liberated? Or is this a form of slavery? white slavery. He works from dusk to dawn and gets a day off Thanks on Sunday us. in some places only if he goes to church and brings a note from the priest that he came to worship. Half the time that is he labors he gets paid. The other half of his work he's working He's working for his employer. So that is where profit comes from. Karl Marx calls this surplus value. And the more employees he has, the higher the profit. But under the first phase of capitalism, you also have free competition. If a shoe factory opens and he gets a good profit, but then another shoe factory opens up and he has to compete with the new factory. So the first factory has an idea. He says, we'll cut my prices and sell more shoes and, and put them out of business. Then the second factory goes to the bank and makes a large loan, but the bank says, we have to look at your books. Security 
of the loans. We have to have a share in your factory. So we, ha we have a marriage of industrial capital and financial capital. Yeah. Out of this marriage comes monopoly capital. and has to have cheap raw materials, large markets, and cheap labor. So this reform becomes a new form of imperialism. Different, a different form of imperialism because the old imperialism collected taxes and tribute. With this comes empire, such as England or India, its jewel in the crown, the United States with the Spanish-American War in 1898, when it took over Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and the Hawaiian Islands. And then we had the First World War in 1914, when Germany had a colony in Africa and were competed with France and England for more colonies because of overproduction and need for more raw materials and bigger markets to sell their goods. Germany had large production facilities but did not have large enough markets to sell their goods and were in competition with England and France and other countries, which is the real source of the First World War. The U.S. made loans to England before the war, so it entered the war to make sure that England was not defeated. Russia was in the war, the poorest country in Europe. With its large colonies, the factories in Russia made large profits selling clothes, boots to the Tsar. But people in Russia wanted to get out of the war and were against the Tsar. So a provisional government was set up under Kerensky. The Allies, England, France, and the U.S. wanted Russia to stay in the war so they could have an Eastern Front. In the factories, the army, the workers, and the soldiers set up councils or Soviets. At that time, there were two left parties in Russia, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The, the Mensheviks were social democrats, and the Bolsheviks were communists. Lenin, the leader of the Bolsheviks, came out with the slogan, blue, peace, land, and all power to the Soviets, and waited till the government was in crisis and then took over the banks <coughs> government offices, post office, barracks of the soldiers and navy ships. Following the revolution, 14 capitalist countries invaded the new Soviet state, including the United States under General Grant's expeditionary forces. They were defeated with the help of peace forces in the capital states who were against the war, who were sick, sick of wars against the, the bloodbath in Europe, with it, what this does have to do with freedom and liberty? Some say we are born free, but are everywhere in chains. Since we evolved from the animal kingdom, We've been progressing in all fields of endeavor. At one time, we walked from place to place, securing food and shelter. Then we used horses, and then came the wheel. Who invented it, nobody knows. With the wheel came the wagon, so our transportation was improved. And then came the invention of iron and the steam engine, and the train, ships, with the steam engine, the airplane with the Wright brothers, and then the rocket to take us to the moon, to Mars, and to explore the cosmos with telescopes, to the Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope, and they're working on telescopes right now that will make the Hubble look small by comparison. So we're finding, we are finding more and more about the nature of matter, its laws, 
and how to use these laws to make progress. At one time, we said that quantum had no order in it, that it was unpredictable. But then scientists were able to take two quantum photons and they heard bleaks from one from the other. They communicated one another. So no matter how far they were apart, they bleaked to one another. Recently, the Chinese and the Austrians conducted an experiment. Where the photons, photons communicated not only with one beep, but with three different in three different ways. In Russia, the system <clears throat> failed. The living conditions did not improve for the average person. Who, for one thing, Russia was the most backward country in Europe. Socialism has to have a highly developed industrial base. So it can take care of its people. It had the most backward industrial base in Europe. And Lenin thought that Germany would have a revolution and would help out Russia. But that never happened. Another reason there were 14 countries, including the United States, then invaded the country right after the revolution, and the, and the Russian state was in ruins. Um, the capitalists never stopped trying to overthrow that government. In 1960 to 1990, the U.S. had 250 bases surrounding the Soviet Union. I seen this in Life magazine, and it made a lot of mistakes. Russia made a lot of mistakes. But we become, but we learn from mistakes. The Chinese have learned from Russia, the mistakes that they made. As it industrialized, they gave some of its benefits to the population. So the people support its government. Half its people have been brought out of poverty in a very short period of time, according to the BBC. They've been increasing their wage at approximately $100 a year. Free health care and a lot of other social benefits. Free schooling. I was listening to Tom Hartman, who has a talk show. A man called up and says he's moving to China. The reason? He met a woman who was working at McDonald's. She's not a manager. He's just a regular worker. She has her own apartment and supports her daughter and takes vacations anywhere in the world. Even in the U.S., that's progress under a communist government. The real freedom, that is real freedom. So is freedom, so is freedom the absence of restraint or is the recognition of necessity. So it's the recognition of necessity. Necessity that brings progress. From the point of view of <laughs> philosophical materialism, freedom consists not in an imaginary state of independence, but in respect to the laws of nature, but in knowledge of the laws of, of nature and the possibility of utilizing them in our practice, the practical activity of these laws. For until we know a law of nature, it's existing, acting independently, <coughs> and outside our mind, makes us slaves to blind the system. But once we know a law which acts out so many times independently of our will and outside of our minds, makes us slaves to blind necessity. But if we know these laws, we have the ability to change things for the better, i.e. progress. Today we are in a historical juncture. We are facing with 
the abolition, the we're facing with the annihilation from atomic warfare or climate disaster. Capitalism is destroying itself, but you, you, by using fossil fuels, destroying all life on the planet. The Audubon Society says half the birds on the planet have died. That's the canary in the coal mine. In the future, either we get rid of capitalism or capitalism will get rid of us, of all life on the earth. That's it. I can help take questions, right? I'm going to give it to you. I'll help with the questions. Uh, anybody got a question they want to start with? So, uh, uh, you're saying that uh, China... Do you China's got an right. It seems as it, it seems yeah, they're like going to China's no, communism is effective. Yeah. But, uh, okay. you can, I mean, there's a long no. history of dairy, China right? being an impoverished country to the sure point where I think it was during the Great Leap Forward they literally had negative GNP. Yeah. I think that's the only so thing how can you how can you say that I, is it? what is it specifically yeah. about China that yeah. they changed to make them? Can you do it? Well, yeah, well, switch from horrible, horrible <laughs> <laughs> to, to a, a thriving economy. Can you repeat the question since it's kind of loud in here? Did you, did you hear me, Sid? I did. Yeah, I heard you. Okay, I don't know if Thank anybody you. else um, had Well, it is, you had different experiments in China. Under Mao Zedong, what happened was he wanted to industrialize very fast. So what he done, he started building factories and backyards to make steel. And he figured that would increase the industrial capacity. But the thing is, they didn't have the infrastructure to take the steel and bring it from one place to another in order to build factories and to build up the country. So the, the idea didn't work at all. It didn't work. And then, I forget his name, but he had a different idea that will bring in capitalism with socialism and, and uh, we'll develop the economy with, with a hybrid economy, with capitalism and socialism. And that's what they've done. And they took that profit, instead of uh, putting it into armaments, like the United States does, the United States puts uh, something like, um, let's see, I forget exactly, but almost all, oh, I think it's about, it was about 41% of its economy went to armaments. Now, under Trump, it's maybe 45 or 50%. So half of its, uh, uh, half of its wealth goes into armaments. So instead of putting into armaments, what the uh, Chinese done, they put a certain amount into armaments, but the rest they gave to the population. When they work, they increase their salaries. So they make the economy work. And then people had a more, a bigger incentive and worked harder. And the economy is, uh, they, they brought over half of the population out of poverty already. And maybe in another 10 years, they'll be up to us as far as their industrial base is concerned. Another thing is, it's not only industrial base, but they got all kinds of social benefits. And they've and they done that through a combination of capitalism and socialism, and eventually they want they want to develop into full socialism. Can I ask, can I ask a follow-up question? So, um, to be a little of a devil's advocate here, it, it sounds like on the one hand you're uh, you're against capitalism, but on no. the other hand, you're, you're it seems like you're saying that the reason that communism is doing so well is they started being more capitalist. Capitalism was a progressive thing at one time. It helped develop the economy, put a lot of people to work, and it developed our industrial base. Otherwise, how could we have what we have now? But it, it, everything dies eventually. Everything turns into its opposite. At one time, we were young people. Now we're old. 
and eventually we're going to die. All social systems die eventually. Capitalism is dying. For one thing, what's happening is they won't put anything into uh, getting rid of this uh, climate disaster that's happening. They're only interested in short-range profit. In China, they're not interested in that. What they're doing is developing their, their, uh, their solar uh, base by solar panels. They have more solar panels than every other country combined, and they want to go into a full solar panel, solar panel uh, also uh, windmills, and also uh, hydropower. Eventually, they're going to have a clean economy. But of course, that don't only depend on them. It depends on other countries doing the same thing. <clears throat> um, right there. Okay. Yeah. Jane. Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, in, spur, in spite of Bernie Sanders and the DSA, some people say that in the United States, if not in the world, capitalism is triumphant. If it's going to go away, when do you think it will leave? It's a, it's a, what, what's happening is, if they keep going like there is, without doing anything about, about climate change, capitalism won't, won't be here, and we won't be here. So it's destroying itself. You know, and somebody doesn't have to destroy it, but the trouble is, is it's everybody's going to be taken with it. That's the problem. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have the uh, precise figures uh, in my back pocket, but I understand. I mean, you you were talking about how the capitalist countries were responsible for a lot of the uh, climate problems, and this is true. However, is not one of the biggest violators uh, China itself? which has put more crud into the air and has caused more pollution, or at least as much, as all of the Western countries combined. How can they be held out as an example to be followed? Yeah, I agree with you. They, 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 have, they're, they were polluting like crazy. But what happened was they realized that if they keep doing like they are, they won't, they won't have no future. So they change. And the thing is, they don't have to depend on short-term profit. They're not interested in profit. They're interested in making the society better. So by, by switching over to a clean type of industrial base, you're making the economy also develop. So it'll help everybody. At first, you were right, but now they changed. Okay. They changed. There's been there's been a, a qualitative change there, as far as yeah. as far as climate is concerned. Are they signed on to the UN climate climate yeah. change, and, yeah. and they've had measurable impact? Well, I don't know how much measurable impact, but they're on the way. For instance, they they have railroads, bullet trains. They go from one city to another real fast. What they've done is, is, is building yours? belts of trees on each side to absorb the, the uh, fo fossil fuel stuff. Okay, uh, well, how about over to, here? Charlie, you want to say something? Yeah, isn't that a standard argument for the fossil fuel industry that other countries like China are producing more pollution than everyone else? Isn't this the paid for propaganda? that people believe without knowing that China produces more solar panels than the rest of the world combined? You know, it's, uh, there are some people that believe this fossil fuel stuff that we can continue to pollute because we can't stop other countries. Is that the, you buy into that fossil fuel social media lie? I don't know. It's not a lie. Because there's nothing to be gained from going along and polluting, polluting their society. They don't know it'll kill off all their industrial base. And they realize that. They're, they're the first one. The people go there and they could see what's happening there. You don't have the same thing here. Um, can I? Uh, I guess I want to clarify that question, I think, 
that I think the U.S. from my understanding is that we we were really polluting, you know, and bringing about disaster through our fueling of the war, and you know, and uh, we've occupied right. Um, <clears throat> You know, Africa and the, I mean, the capitalism has kind of caused a lot of problems with the U.S. I guess U.S. style capitalism, right? Um, no, it's, no. A, it's all the same. Okay. Uh, Over here. Okay, just want to finish what, uh, what you're saying. Okay, let me just finish what you're saying. The United States has 800 bases around the world. And with those bases, they got planes flying all the time, they got ships. And that causes a ton of pollution, tons and tons of pollution. All those ships in the air and all those ships, all those uh, ships not in the water. Tons of pollution. All right. I, I wanted to this ask up there is, I saw in the Ukraine, the Oliver Stone okay. movie shows, the U.S. is in, exporting coal to the Ukraine. They are. You know, so you would think that is such a... a you know, that causes climate change. Okay. You know, All right, questions over here, Ellen. Ellen, one point right of capitalism is right. Right here, Ellen. Okay, Ellen, I'm right sorry, there. we want to say something. Right here. Yeah, and then I'll come. Ellen, I have my hands up. Okay, right. go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Whoever, you or you? Okay. okay. <laughs> have you considered the possibility that civilization that you initially talked about was the beginning of the end? That civilization is the problem, not capitalism, feudalism, slavery. Oh, so, yeah. The whole idea of once we decided we were going to stay in one place and start polluting the little place we lived in, and then we started expanding across the world yeah. in astronomical numbers because we were able to grow yeah. excess food. <laughs> that was the beginning and the end, and you and I are sitting at the end of the end. Well, and all of this, I just want to finish. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, just what, so the question's clear. Yeah, okay. The question is, do you not think that we've already passed the whole idea of solar energy? Any energy is energy. It's heat, no matter where it comes from. And once you keep, we're a heat-producing species, if you will. And we've had our time on Earth, and it's changing. And we have five or ten years to do something completely different. Learn how to live with the pollution we can't stop. Cut our numbers down to What do you think? Um, uh, for instance, we started out as um, anthropoid apes. The we way still are. The way, the way you're talking, there would be no progress in the world. We'd still be back I think in the trees. Need, excuse me. I think you need You'd to be back find. in the trees. You wouldn't have progress. any societies. There would be no human what beings. What do you mean by progress? Let me finish. There would be no human beings and no society of any kind, no life on the earth, and we never should have evolved. That's what you're saying. No, I'm not. No, you are. That's, that's, that's what you're saying. That's, that's what, right. you're what you call, you need to define what you call progress. What progress, I said, for instance, at one time we'd never sitting here eating food, we'd be, we'd be hunting and gathering in the forest somewhere. Is that the way you want to live forever? Some kind of society that learns mm -hmm. not to shit in its own house, okay, which we're doing. What you're saying is impossible. No, it isn't. It's, a, it's, a, it's the evolution. Well, I mean, are you saying that the Chinese socialism is better than our no. Western capitalism? No, he said nothing they, is. Yeah, no. he's saying nothing is, and you, I thought you were arguing that no, communism and what socialism saying, will evolve. There's no such thing as good progress, e that's evolution. what he's saying. Yes, I am. But this is There's no it. such thing as good You're progress. You're not talking about it. If you talk to an average person in the street, if you tell them you, you have to live in the tree and you have to gather food and kill animals in the forest, Guess what they'll tell you? I'm a vegan. And well, on top of I don't, that, I don't care what you. Okay, just Your ideas are pretty, uh, pretty backward. I, but okay, well, yeah, she has one too. Okay. So, Go I'm gonna so going back to personal to freedom, like that. All right, the louder, about, please. The topic is about personal freedom, right? Not personal freedom. Or the history of freedom. Yeah. So, so would you say communist China, the people there, have more freedom than the people in the U.S.? It depends how you uh, how, how you give a definition of freedom. To me, a definition of freedom, for one thing, you have to have the basics. You have to have food, and you have to have shelter, and you have to have a decent living, 
so you, so you can live like a human being. In the United States, it's going backward. And during the Roosevelt administration, and right after the war, we were living pretty good. Now, 40% of the population have stopped looking for work. Most people have to work two or three jobs. Work is very precarious and very insecure, and we're going backward. But what do you think about Milton Friedman's idea of capitalism and freedom? Now, capitalism is freedom for the capitalists. I'm not going to Okay, George, I have... He, oh, yeah, he wanted to go. He was late a long time. Would, would you say there's a difference between <coughs> the American Revolution and the French Revolution. I just want to make a comment on that because the American Revolution resulted in, uh, in uh, a constitutional republic. But the French Revolution resulted in a reign of terror with all this killing. They killed King Louis yeah. and Marie Antoinette, they guillotined yeah. them, okay. and, then, and, 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 and then they made Napoleon Bonaparte the dictator for life. Now, there's a qualitative difference, I think, between American Revolution and the French Revolution. Yeah, but you're not taking in certain things. You're not taking in slavery, where half the people on the ships of slaves died. You're not taking in the, uh, the genocide against the Indians. The only good Indian was a dead Indian. You're not taking that into consideration. The United States, the United States invaded the, the, the Europeans invaded this country and tried to kill off the Indians. For instance, uh, for instance, Washington and Jefferson were slaveholders. You're not taking that in consideration. One thing, I wanted to say there was a lot of war between 1776 and 1789. Um, you know, there, you, I, there's this thing, liberty. Well, I'm just clarifying. The, yeah, to his not question. The it's not the moderator's job, let some speakers speak. Yeah, well, it was relevant. Okay, so that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. All right, cool it. You be moderator, okay? Yeah, you could do better. Right. Pat? I think he could. Oh, wait, wait, no, he hasn't gone yet. Uh -huh. These are two quick questions. One, um, if I missed it, I apologize. What's your definition of capitalism? Capitalism. Two, well, for right, instance, okay. A worker works eight hours a day, let's say. Not now, of course but back in time. The first two or three hours, he makes enough for his wages. The other hours goes to the profit of the capitalists. It's a form of exploitation, a form of slavery. It's a higher form of slavery than feudalism or out and out slavery, but still a form of slavery. Capitalism is waste slavery. That's what Marx calls it, and that's what it is. Interesting. Interesting. The other, the, other, the other quick question I had is, you know, you talk about the climate disaster. Where does, uh, where does nuclear power fit in as a solution to, as a it, part it of the solution? There's no solution, solution at all. Uh. What's, that? What's that? It's not a solution. Hey, why are, it, then why is look China? Look what happened in the Japan. And that, um, that, that thing that broke in Japan, some of it's being felt as far as Los Angeles now. Very dangerous. And the Ukraine. Right. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you haven't gone, right? Uh, question. Where are we going to be in 2050? Nobody knows. <laughs> are we going to be around? Either, are we gonna, either we're going to make tremendous progress or we'll be, we're, we're coming to the point where all life on Earth will be extinct, one or the other. What, what would you propose if, if you were president? Or? King. Well, I'd go into socialism, of course. <laughs> sure. You think Bernie would do, has got ideas? No, he's not a socialist. All right. He's, a, he's what you call... But to change. He's what you right call track. a social democrat. A social democrat started in Germany under uh, Bismarck in about 1880 or so. What happened was Karl Marx had a party there and they were winning. Um, every two years or four years, they were keep winning and winning and winning. So Bismarck got an idea, I'll bring some reforms and call it social democracy. Because that's what Karl Marx called it. So he took over the word social democracy, but it has nothing to do with socialism. It has to do with reform of capitalism. Okay. I think uh, babe. Um, okay. babe. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, uh, back around 1960 or so, Khrushchev said that within the next 12 years or so, uh, Russia will pass uh, America up and yeah. we will wave bye-bye. Yeah. And um, then um, uh, they'll beg us for help and uh, <laughs> maybe we'll help them and maybe we won't. And uh, then, of course, Russia eventually fell apart. Is there uh, the Soviet um, Union. Yeah. And then, of course, China had their revolution, and they were dedicated communists. I heard people say that if you went to China and you uh, ate in a restaurant and you left a tip, they wouldn't take the tip because they frowned on capitalism, and they considered that capitalism. Yeah. But to the extent that China has uh, Questions adopted coming, right? capitalist yeah. policies, they have fared much better. So it seems to me that the answer is not socialism, but the answer is capitalism. Well, they, uh, Russia has become capitalist. No. China has, has gone more capitalist. You're making a speech. Uh, for yeah. one thing, um, it's not capitalist. It's a hybrid economy. It has socialism as it can, capitalism. And eventually, it's going to get rid of the capitalism. What happened recently, there were middlemen selling oranges to the people there. And the people said, well, what do we need the middlemen for? Let's, let's just take the oranges and distribute ourselves. So that's a form of getting rid of capitalism. That's called, but that's not. That's called, that's called. Yeah, realistically, uh, several speakers ago, you were uh, asked uh, what direction we should be going, and I believe that you had said socialism. Now, as we all know, there are, like, you know, Heinz uh, 57, we have uh, Heinz 57 varieties of socialism, yeah. and a new one gets invented in a coffee house somewhere uh, <laughs> every year. Uh, what is your view, if you were king of the world, what would be your view for rectifying all this, and what form of socialism uh, would you be introducing us to? Uh, for one thing, socialism is going to take a different path in different countries because they all have their own histories, their own backgrounds, and things of that nature. So socialism has to correspond to the way people were living before to a certain degree. But socialism eventually means there will be no profit making. People will own and control the means of production, the farms, the factories, everything that makes anything. Huh. They'll control it themselves and be the controllers of that, and there won't be anybody making a profit off of workers. That would be social. Mm -hmm. Plus you have free schooling, free health care, and so forth, that'll come out of your taxes. Huh. I, could I ask, for Charlie's question, what do you think, do you see like the propaganda, CIA type propaganda fighting socialism? I mean, being what undermines the ability, it's kind of capitalism's invisible empire war on socialism. Well, all these countries like Hitler was very much against socialism, but he realized that people in Germany wanted socialism, so what did he call his party? National Socialism. The na that's what Nazi means, the National Socialist Party. People wanted socialism because they seen from the end of the World War I, the Great Depression, everything was going down, down, down. So he called it that in order to get support from the majority of people. So socialism is able to solve a lot of the contradictions of capitalism and it gives a decent wage to people. You don't have global disaster, you don't have constant wars, but capitalism there's just constant wars. The United States has been in war for over 20 years now in Afghanistan. It's perpetual war. Why? Because the war makers own the government. The oil industries own the government. And they want to make profit. The whole thing of capitalism is to make profit. 
not to help people. It's for profit before people. Isn't that nationalism rather than so national no, socialism? Let's somebody, let's, mm -hmm. let somebody else say that. All right. Uh, Charlie? Why? Yeah, Sid, um, sitting in the United States, didn't they uh, enact a constitution in 1789 yeah. because they were afraid people would want more freedoms and get rid of this aristocracy? And um, uh, it will not perhaps socialism at that time? No, you couldn't have socialism at that time. There was no industrial base at all. How could you feed all the people with the type of economy we had during the revolution? Okay. Well, it didn't have the basis for it, no. It didn't have the basis at all. So you had to have slavery? No, but the capitalism was progressive. Let's face it. it at one the, point, the East India Tea was Company. Progressive. It helped develop the economy. It gave a, a, a base, an industrial base, so it could develop things. Capitalism was a progressive system. So now security. it's turned into its opposite. If we don't get rid of it, Alan. it'll get rid of us. What's the progress of putting back Alan. Alan. those mills in New England? Oh, That's progress. <laughs> Right, yeah, right. I think everybody, Tim hasn't asked one of Well, else. I'm going to ask you this. The data for myself clearly indicates that capitalism, I mean that capitalism is won. The world in 1989 chose to go capitalist rather than communist. China has gone, by adopting free market reforms, that's what developed them. And what you're simply saying to me, and, and what you're clearly saying to me goes against all the data that I've known and all the things that I've been told about capitalism. Your um, comment on why I'm wrong. Well, you're wrong for one thing. It won't do anything about climate change. And if we don't do something in maybe 10 to 12 years, it'll be a qualitative change, a tipping point where you go in the opposite direction and there won't be no turning back. Either you get rid of it or they'll get rid of us. Or how yeah. about, there is no other how about just getting ourselves out of it with the, the new technology and monetary comes by new companies? You know, that's another solution. They don't seem to work that way. Yeah, over here. I, I'd she like to rebut uh, Tim. Uh, you know, he hangs on to this idea of capitalism like it's Santa Claus or something. It's like not. But the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 problem, the problem with the premise of capitalism is that it doesn't trickle down, at least with us. Now, maybe it, it did with China and it does in other socialist countries like France. You know, but here it doesn't trickle down, and you've got all the wealth is up, it's up at the top, and it's, it, it is essentially the same thing as the European monarchies, which we overthrew when we came here. You know, it, it, we're just doing the same thing, but we call it something else. Inequality has actually gone down. Mm -hmm. What about Venezuela? Yeah. And, and how yeah. many of, here's my question. How many of you know this electric car hype that they make the electricity out of coal? <laughs> well, for one thing, and gas. change is natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's part of all matter is change. Yeah. And we went through four, four different uh, uh, civiliz type of civilizations. We went through primitive communism under, let's say, the American Indians or the German tribes or the Roman tribes. Mm -hmm. Went into slavery, went into feudalism. Now we're into capitalism, and capitalism is moving into socialism. It's a, it's a natural way of moving. It's more or less like somebody is born, and then they become a certain age, and then it's puberty, and then there's old age, and then there's death. Every, everything goes through processes, and societies go through processes. And the processes now, this type of system of capitalism is dying. And if we don't do something, to get rid of it, we'll, we'll all be gotten rid of. There's I'm, no other way. I'm going to give a question to myself that relates. Is the I recently saw this James Addison, who has found the cure for cancer, but he also went to the Texas, uh, the Texas uh, Senate, 
and to, instead of for evolution as opposed to this idea that it's like positive and, or that we're just exceptional, America's great. I, I think it's what I like about SIDS and Marx's and uh, this idea is evolution, you know, um, that it's a real threat. Capitalism likes to say, deny evolution. Uh, they spend a lot of money on saying, you know, intellectual, des intelligent design as opposed to evolution because they, they're trying to stop this. It's a threat to their profits. For one thing, I think Marx was like Darwin to a certain degree. He found out the laws of society and the changes in society. He made a profound uh, discovery, like Darwin made a, a profound discovery. But people now in the capitalist world don't recognize it. But at one time we thought there's all kinds of devils and and uh, and, and, and 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 superstition, all kinds of superstitions, and a lot of people got rid of this. So eventually we get rid of the thing that doesn't bring progress. And capitalism is no longer bringing progress. So one time it did. It doesn't anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Let me come to her. Yeah, she's been here. Isn't capitalism based on growth? And you can't have continuous growth in a finite world. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So capitalism Correct. doesn't right. work. Well, Eventually it doesn't for work. For one thing, could you repeat when you that? Yeah. Television, could you repeat repeat the, she said that capitalism is growth, and you can't have I'm infinite limited. growth. No, you can't. Right, and so capitalism. For one thing, is when you put on television, they're always trying to sell you something, something you really don't need. For instance, they sell you a different, a different model of car. Oh, this car is a car and so far. And it's actually maybe yeah. the model has changed a little bit. But it's not enough to produce another car and waste all this material on producing new cars every year and stuff of that nature. It's a, it's a defunct system. You're right. Consumer. Uh, um, yeah, well, I guess go ahead. And okay. then you, mm -hmm. uh, in the timeline of history, don't you think the Trump impeachment will, will be seen as a partisan attempted coup? Like yeah. the banana republics, yeah. banana Holy republics. God. You Democrats are making a banana republic out of this. <laughs> Holy I like bananas, though. I like bananas, though. Don't bananas are good. Let's keep, let's keep Hitler in Germany. It's about the same. What do you think about McTavish bananas? Or Macintosh bananas? Let's have a question here. This one will be quick. It, are, do we live in a capitalist country? Yeah, definitely. No. Okay, no, we don't. But, all right. I'll, I'll no, we don't. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Right. Um, capitalism was profit. I want to say profit. Do you believe in I, private I, property, Sid? Mm -hmm. Huh? Do you believe in ownership of private property? Uh, no. Well, in this system, people have private property. A lot of them doesn't do no harm if you have your own house. I don't see how it harms anybody. If you use private property uh, to exploit other people, then it's harmful. So you're talking about all forms of business are a form of exploitation then, correct? What? All forms of business where a guy gets some money, invests it, and he then provides jobs in the business. Yeah. You're telling me that's sort of, that's a form of exploitation, yeah, correct? Yeah, form of exploitation. Right. Marx thought private small property scale. was theft. No. It's only on a small scale. So, so in other when words... When you talk about capitalists, you have talked about like the Rockefellers or the Morgans or the Basils or people like that. Right. And also, I think the Constitution, the way it's been interpreted is that businesses, you know, are persons, and so they have more money, therefore they have more rights. I, the laws are all written to, they get tax, they don't pay taxes. So they, they do write the laws, unfortunately, to exploit us, you know, in a capitalistic way. Uh, and, uh, back here, we have a... Uh, yeah, you said that people Stand up. are okay to have a uh, private property when is it not okay? If well, you're exploiting, decides, if you're exploiting somebody with it. Who, okay, who decides who's exploiting who? The exploiting you know, person. Nobody decides. If you make money off of somebody else's as labor, 
Then you're then you're exploiting somebody. It's an objective thing. But that's an objective thing. If you privatize our public estate, that's exploitation of the group, which we have no way to redress other than protest or revolution, and that's hard to pull off when they've got the media and we don't. You know, so they they can we're easily uh, exploited. The one percent is it's got all the money, and, and we have less and less. That's called you know structural exploitation uh, of the poor. They they privatize the public estate. Okay, now everybody's making comments. Okay, I am uh, inserting comments just as you can. Okay, does right, anybody else have a comment or a question? In a socialism, you can comment or question. Okay, so that's how I'm running it. The being problem a is you're wrong. Charlie, you're doing a great job. Yeah, said last week. Can I have some water, please? All right, let's get Charlie's question. You said last week one of the people during the rebuttals told these two young people they shouldn't call themselves socialists. Uh, and they shouldn't call themselves socialists. And I guess they shouldn't want to have socialism in the United States. What do you think about that? Let me finish. Well, we have to. All right. If you don't, like I said, if you don't get rid of it. All right. The politics are interrupting me. What was the question? I'm sorry. Oh, no. Should, well, should these young people be ashamed of calling themselves socialists? They shouldn't do that. I don't know. I wasn't there. I believe you. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's an answer. <laughs> I wasn't there. Okay. I don't know what this is. Sid, uh, could you answer a question I've wondered about? Is Trotsky um, or uh, Lenin, I mean, are they true socialists or were they kind of put in there to, you know, kind of mess up? It, I, my understanding, like John Reed was a pushing for the socialist revolution and yeah. what, what happened, you know? Oh, well, uh, what happened is um, Trotsky became uh, head of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. He was first to mention it. And uh, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a Marxist. Then he became a Marxist and he joined the Bolshevik party. And then they claim, well they didn't claim, what happened was he had a theory of permanent revolution. What he meant by that is the Soviet Union, since it had its own revolution, to go into other countries and, and ferment revolution. That doesn't work. If the people in the country don't want it, you can't push it out. It doesn't work at all. And he had this idea of permanent revolution, which was all wrong. But then Stalin had him killed, right? And was Stalin well, no, more revolutionary than more, the better? No. I don't know if he had him killed. That's what the propaganda is. He was killed in Mexico by somebody uh, that didn't didn't like him. Um, I don't I don't know much about it, but uh, Stalin he was good to a certain degree. He had the five-year plans, and the five-year plans industrialized the country. If it wasn't for the five-year plans, they never would have won against they never would have won against Germany. Because they wouldn't have the industrial base, and what Jeremy Stalin Corbyn also done, shit, sorry. He, he sorry. moved a lot of factories with in the back of the Ural Mountains, so the Nazis couldn't bomb it. And I was working. I wasn't working. I was living in Skokie. I met a Russian woman, and she said that a lot of the Jews were brought behind the Ural Mountains, so the Nazis couldn't capture them. So uh, there's good and bad in Stalin. <laughs> Luke? Yeah, uh, Sid, uh, I mean, how did you how did you come to your your view of, of being a, a communist? How, how did you? Uh, well, for one thing, I had people in the neighborhood that had those ideas. I lived on the west side, <laughs> in, uh, 1530 South Trumbull, which is the west side, and uh, a lot, there used to be the Communist Party speaking on Friday nights on Rosso Road in front of What the years? Theater. What years was this? Oh, this was uh, back in the 50s somewhere. 50s? Okay. Yeah, you know, early 50s or, or 40s. The local Communist Party. Yeah, okay. and then I didn't pay much attention to it. And then somebody said, why don't you go to Buckhouse Square with me? 
Ah, okay. Buckhouse Square. Yeah. So I went with them. I heard all kinds of speeches. And I got the idea of socialism, but I didn't understand it very well. And then I started reading it, and I started reading about the philosophy by Engels and Marx, uh, dialectical materialism, and, and history and things like that. And I came to the conclusion that this is an exploitive society. And, if, and, and it's, it's a type of society that doesn't care about its people. It cares about profits. That's all it cares about. Sometimes it has to do things, like under DeRosa, we had a new deal. He didn't do this because he was a good man. He was scared there might be a revolution in the United States. In the United States, there was about 100,000 communists in the United States. In Russia, there was only about 16 or 20,000 communists. So he was fearful, yeah, yeah. and he brought in the New Deal. Right. Uh, let me just follow up with that on, on that thought. Uh, why do you think communism has just failed miserably? Well, it's, it's not failing. Well, I'm not talking China. about like Russia. Well, China, like uh, China, Russia, was the most backward country in all of Europe. It was the weak, weakest link in the chain. Yeah. That's why it broke. But there were millions of people that were uh, uh, killed and exploited. And well, millions and millions. Well, under the czar, people were dying left and right. Okay. They didn't have well, enough food. <laughs> but one doesn't it, make the was, one wrong. There was, there was programs against Jewish people, okay. against minorities. There was no heaven, that's for sure. Yeah. That's why they had a revolution. And they were sick and tired of the war. Okay. My right, grandpa thanks. ran out of Russia because it was so wonderful. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you would think, it's just a horrible place. Is yeah, it, don't the tariffs have about. something to do, like right now we have, or we put sanctions on them? I mean, they are, they've been a, an enemy of the powers that we need an enemy. Does that fit with your theory? Well, like, well if you don't have an enemy, them. then you can't give subsidies to the uh, munitions makers. Yeah. And they give subsidies to munitions makers by having wars. They make tremendous profits. And the oil industry makes tremendous profits off the market. Thank you. So they so don't want to give rid of oil. And the heroin industry. Yeah, the rest of it. Too. Right? Uh, the pharma. The thing is about capitalism, it puts, it puts profits before. Yeah, like the monopoly powers. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. And a lot of people. I think could see that now to a certain degree because a lot of people are, are uh, on a type of uh, work that is very precarious. Some of them are called only if they, if they need work in, in the place. Some of them are working two, three, four jobs. It's very precarious the type of employment we have now. At one time people worked eight hours. They knew what they were going to get. And they had steady jobs, now that is all. Well, the business leadership of the country has been just torn. Yeah. The manager's revolution by Burnham was a CIA-sponsored war against unions. You know, so <laughs> well, they, a, that's a covert operation. It's not only that. Certain people are living fairly good now, and they're the ones that support capital. Yeah. They, don't, they don't look at obje objective reality to look how other people are living. They only look at themselves. The stock market makes people think that they're, you know, doing great, but that's kind of a bubble, right? Um, yeah, yeah, here. Again, I just have this question. You did that timeline, you know, from slavery to yeah. that. Isn't that really just an observation, not a discovery? And we could um, easily have gone another direction 10,000 no, years no. ago? Well, of course we could have. I'm asking what you think we could have no, done. No, it's, it's an evolutionary process. Really? Yeah, of Shouldn't course. It, couldn't have gone Darwin anyway. proved that there was an evolutionary We're process. We're not talking about animals. You, you want the same thing in society. Society forms the same laws. That's the it's point constantly I'm changing. Making. It's changing in a progressive direction. Step back and define progressive. And then you could have gone in a completely different direction 10,000 years ago when we decided to settle down. We might have said, wait, this isn't going to work. Let's do something else. We don't know what that something that's is. A, that's a, it's not in stone. That's, a, that's a mental construct you're giving me. That's not reality. What's reality? Reality is what happened. Define it, please. Objective reality is what happened in history. So are we stuck with it? Yeah, we're stuck with it, of course. Is what you're stuck with. Yeah. You're, you're, what you're doing 
is inventing your own reality. That's no, no. not reality. I'm no, saying no. we're at a point where this is all ending. That's the other half of it. Now it's, we're going it, to go It's not necessarily day. ending. It isn't. If we have the knowledge to change it. No, Nobody has the knowledge to change. It's too far right, it's gone. dialogue, come on. The, with the environmental problem. Okay. Okay. Um, Pat, then... then uh, yeah, I have one question. You were saying uh, a lot for reality. Uh, how is your reality any more real than his reality, or my reality, or his reality? No, oh, it's all real. You're it's living all, it every day. You're living it every day. Why isn't it real? It's not in, a, in a, all in your mind. You were criticizing his well, reality, that's a, which that's, is just as real. That's a philosophy that is very subjective. It's a subjective reality. There's, there's a philosopher, I forget his name, he says, when I look out, I could see things. But if I turn around, it's not there. There's no proof it's there. That's what he, that's, that, yeah, that's what he says. I, I forget his name. He's, a, he's what you Hume. call a, a, a sub David Hume. No, it wasn't David. It's a, yes, it was. It's subjective. It's a subjective um, philosophy. There's no reality at all, reality except what one makes in his own mind. Or Socrates right looked at the wall, you know. In the shadows. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I believe in materialism. I believe in living the life we are and trying to improve it. And that's what we're constantly trying to do. Progress is a natural feature of all men, including social men. Do, do, do you think these two uh, top presidential candidates, Sanders and Warren, socialists, they're socialists, uh, do you think they, they, they don't reflect uh, mainstream America, right? Right, they don't. Uh, for one thing, they're not social. They're social democrats. And I, I already give the definition under Bismarck, he was a social democrat. Medicare social democrats all, are reformers, they're not revolutionaries. Roosevelt was not a revolutionary, he was a reformer. He was a, he was a social democrat. Okay. He's not called that in the United States, but if you go to Europe, that's what they would say, he was a social democrat. Okay. not a socialist. Who is a good example of a socialist uh, leader? Well, Lenin, uh, Lenin, uh, Lenin uh, Castro, Jay, Castro, Jay. Mao, Mao Zedong. He was a, he was a How about in the West? Yeah. Okay. In the West, you had a lot of <laughs> Western <laughs> leaders. Gus Hall in the United States. Gus Hall. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, Charlie. Yeah, I said I heard you mention a couple times, somehow or other, that industrialization is required to implement socialism. Huh. Yet socialism is found, I lived in rural areas, in agricultural communities. You've never heard of the barn raising and collective assistance and, and harvesting and collective purchase of equipment yeah, and the co-op movement. And you saying socialism, that doesn't require any industrialization. That just requires people we want to get together collectively and are willing to work together instead of keeping everything for themselves. Right? It's called the corporation. Yeah, that's a, that's a form of socialism. But the trouble is, if you have a farm, you need implements. Implements are made out of steel, made out of iron, and you have to have industrialization to do that. You have farm implements. The tractors are made, you have to have industrialization to do that. If you just went to tilling the farm by hand, you wouldn't have that type of production. Never would. If you can't go back to tilling by hand. So what is it? You got to have industrial, what do you want? You got to have equipment first before you have a farm? You got to have the farm first. Yeah? Don't you but realize then it's that? process, it changes. So but you got to have the farm first. Yeah. Along those lines, I'd like to ask I know a question. You have to have a farm. property rights. But in order to have the food production that we need, 
to feed over 7 billion people on the earth, you have to have industrial. I don't need a It'd machine to harvest. Harvest. I don't need a machine to harvest my potatoes. All right. I'll come to you. I'm going to put one, and then I'll let you go. To pick I want to right. say that, one. Is, what about, like, the um, the way Monsanto, and, like, you have a farm, okay. but then this Monsanto, the monopoly, right. comes up with hybrid GMO seeds, that basically take over and then the little farmer's seeds don't okay. work. And so there's a ways of this, again, the, the monopoly, the political monopoly to okay. wage war on we're real quick. socialism. We're going to do socialism. five more minutes of rebuttal I, of that questions. That is the nature of fascism, really. We'll do five more minutes of questions and then we'll go to rebuttals. Difficult. So who's next? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, you have, him, have him go. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm confused. I don't know if Sid Cohn is giving the answers or this young lady here is giving oh, all come the on. answers. It's not a question. She seems to take it over completely. This is a personal attack. That's not her. Personal attack. Come on. Uh -huh. Without attacking come on. somebody. All right, next. Free speech forum. All right, free speech. Thank you. Let's go to the rebuttal. Okay, let's go to the rebuttals. All right, let's go to rebuttals. You count How many people want to do a rebuttal? Ooh, ooh, I do. <laughs> One, All right, I two, three, four, five, six, no seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten. We'll go about four minutes. That's it? Four okay. minutes. Okay. Four minutes. Okay. Four minutes. okay. Let's yeah. go. Four, four, Let's get our first yes. rebuttal, Mr. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. You want to do a rebuttal, Mr. Travis? Go ahead. It's all yours. Outstanding. It's all yours if you want to rebut. Let's see. All right, first. All right, let's get let's get, our, let's get our first rebutter up there, please. Cement for you. All right. Go ahead. You wanted to rebut. Get in there. Exactly. All right. Let's go. Four minutes. I don't like going first. That means everybody's going to rebut me afterwards. Um, I don't say the last word yet. Whatever you say, um, we disagree. So, <laughs> so the reason why I asked if we were a capitalist country is because I suspected that Sid thought we were, and I know for a fact that we're not. So all these critiques about the current American system are misguided as he thinks that they're critiques against capitalism. They're not. We don't have a capitalist system. And so I'm looking right now at the 10th place of the communist Are manifesto. you keeping that? I will. Um, yeah. No, I can bring you a fresh it's, it's, one. I'm I have to wash my eyes birds. afterwards. Oh, you know okay. I mean? so, I'll bring you a fresh one. Okay. Uh, one of them is a heavy... Well, so one you. of the planks is a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Yeah. That doesn't sound like capitalism to me if you have a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. They needed to well, undo like some capitalism in order to bring that about. They had to work uh, the 16th Amendment to the Constitution. And I'm sure that a lot of communists and socialists think that heavy progressive taxation is a great idea. But as I recall, and you know, if somebody wants to correct me, they can. Um, the graduate, the progressive income tax, the amendment was primarily as a war revenue measure. We needed money for the war. We need to, and we promise it'll only hit a tiny sliver, and it'll only be a certain small percentage, and it'll only be for a limited amount of time. All those things turned out not to be true, but it started as we need to feed the war machine, so we need to have a progressive income tax. So, what, somebody might argue that having the graduated income taxes that they're that they're pro war because that's where the roots are. Uh, abolition of all One rights. One at a time, Charlie. Abolition of all rights of inheritance. We're not there yet, but uh, we're you know every time we. I'm I'm up here, Charlie. Uh, every time we talk about increasing the, uh, the death tax, you know maybe it's not be forty or fifty percent, maybe not fifty, sixty percent. The more you chip away at it, the less we have rights of inheritance. Let's see. Um, central, this is probably the biggest one for me, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Gee, I, 
That sounds to me like the Federal Reserve. That doesn't sound very capitalist to me. If we were going to actually do capitalism, we would eliminate the central bank, where we have this uh, this small elite group of central bankers that get to decide how much money is going to be in the economy, what the interest rates are. The idea that we have to live in that system is horrendous. This is not capitalism. Okay, keep the butter. Let's see. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's a couple other things in there, but um, the idea that Sid is also going to talk about how important it is to uh, deal with the climate disaster and that the free market won't do anything about climate change. Well, I mean, we, we arguably are, are more free market than, than other systems, but we're not by any stretch free market in any kind of absolute sense. If you had a free market, what I suspect would happen, you know, without a central bank, without progressive taxation, people are able to accumulate wealth and start their own businesses, and there wouldn't be, you know, major barriers to entry. You might have lots of competition bring prices down, but you also have, I think, an acceleration in the progress of technology. Maybe we have machines and technology and systems that use less and less energy. We might even end up developing new kinds of technology that can more rapidly mitigate the effects of climate change. But you know, if we're going to saddle our economy down with all kinds of regulations and more taxes so that everybody's kind of stuck trudging really, really hard through, through their lives, I don't, I don't think that works. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is uh, I, I, the, the title of this was supposed to be something like the history of freedom or something like that, but it just seemed like a, you know, hey, cap uh, capitalism's bad, socialism and communism are good, and I, I don't know, I was a little bit of a bait and switch. <laughs> That's exactly what communism is, bait and switch. Okay. Well, well I just want to say about the timeline of timeline of history, uh, beginning with the Bible, which I'm a Christian, but I'm not really into the Bible, but the, the, Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden contained the tree of knowledge of good and evil, from which Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat. When they disobeyed and ate the forbidden fruit, God drove them from the garden. Their Talk sin, into the microphone. Their sin and consequent lust of God's grace and, and of their paradise is known as the fall of fall of man. I just want to, that's, that's the first thing on the timeline. Okay, and then the, like, what about the Magna Carta of 1215, uh, a list of, 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 of rights and privileges that King John of England signed in 1215. It, it established the king could not levy taxes without the consent of the legislature and also gave the people the right of uh, tri trial by jury and, uh, and other legal processes. I mean, this is in the timeline of, of, of history. And uh, let's see. And uh, then in the 1950s, there was the McCarthyism. Extreme, extreme opposition, extreme opposition to communism. Senator, Senator Joe McCarthy publicized accusations without evidence to support charges. And that's something what's, like what's happened with Trump. I mean, you know, all these charges, Mueller and all this stuff, and, uh, and they don't have any evidence. And the last thing I was going to say, the Holocaust, the killing of six million Jews by Nazis during World War II, this was Hitler's final solution for the Jewish problem, according to him. And uh, this is another in the timeline of history. <clears throat> okay. Okay, next. I'll go nice. next. Very nice. Jane is going. <laughs> okay, Gene, after that, I'm going. Uh, I wanted to make uh, two points. First, uh, Bernie Sanders certainly is no socialist. He's more, I would call it social welfare. I don't know why he calls himself a socialist. It's hard to figure out. Uh, and I think that's what Sid kind of said. The second point is that Sid said is there are a fair number of people who are relatively well off. I'm on the very bottom of that. But still, hey, I've had checks since 1964 every month. 
since 1964. I either worked and granted when I was working I held on to my job for dear life, but when I retired uh, I did what I felt like. So uh, I am a, a bit of a supporter of our system in a sense that I, I, if I really didn't like it here, I could go to Canada, right? But I'm here. I must Canada? like it here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now. Are we allowed to work in Canada? I'm gonna. I'm gonna make a speech. <laughs> Said, as far as I'm concerned, your analysis is dead wrong. I'm going to play a couple clips here from an economist by the name of Johann Norberg. The first one's going to be about democratic socialism. And if I know correctly, I think this guy has a lot to say about democratic socialism. Let's give it a listen. Jeremy Corbyn of the British Labour Party wants a new kind of democratic socialism, with majority decisions controlling local communities, services, and workplaces. Does that mean people power, democratic harmony, dead wrong? The model for this reform is the direct democracy in Corbyn's own campaign organization, Momentum. But incidentally, momentum is right now being torn apart because of this. The leadership wants online voting to guide the organization, but the opposition to momentum thinks Hold on. that creates unaccountable issues, so they can... We're going to try something else here. I'm going to get to another clip. Basically, democratic socialism does not work. It never has. When you get those democratic socialists into power, they want to grab it a little more. They want to take it and control you and control your life, and you tend to lose your freedom. Milton Friedman was right. When you have economic freedom, you have political freedom. Freedom's not our natural state. We must continually strive for it and try to get to try for it. And you know something? That's even the freedom to let somebody like Greta talk us about a bunch of, bunch of lies. And you know something? Greta's dead wrong. I'm going to let Mr. Johan Norberg tell us why. Planet is warming and all you can do is talk about money and fairy tales about eternal economic growth. You've stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. I'm sorry, Greta Thunberg. I share your worry about global warming. But that is dead wrong. It is more fair to say that economic growth gave you and me a childhood. Before we fill the skies with greenhouse gases, every second child died before their 15th birthday. And they did not have a school to strike from. 90% were illiterate. So our ancestors did not burn fossil fuels because they were stupid or evil, but because they wanted to give us a future. And we still need economic growth to protect us against all sorts of threats. The risk of dying in a climate-related disaster, floods, droughts, storms, and extreme heat, has actually been reduced by more than 90% since the 1950s. Not because we have fewer disasters today, but because we have more wealth and technology to save human lives. Had we had negative growth since then, we would have had less global warming, and yet, almost half a million more people would die every year because of climate-related incidents. Now we need to create this growth based on green technologies that do not emit greenhouse gases. But that's expensive. Do we really think that that is going to happen in shrinking economies that have to deal with mass unemployment? If not, then I'm sorry, we're going to have to talk about money. And the thing is, when you look at the evidence, global capitalism and free trade and democratic governments have produced more to give us to give us a good way of life. Literacy has been down in the world. 
the 20 tons alone, you might think it was a lost decade, but we saw a great reduction in abject worldwide poverty. Since about 2000 or so, we've seen democratic governments outpace those of dictatorships. We're seeing longer lives. So fooey to you guys who think that we're headed in the wrong direction. We do have to keep striving for our leaders. And one of my friends said the blessings of Donald Trump were now Maybe we're going to have to choose better. And I agree, I don't like Trump, so maybe we, it might be the impetus to get us into our elections and choose better. I don't buy this thing that we're, going to, that we're in a hell of a handbasket for in our modern society. I think we're living and actually living in some, a golden age. We're seeing literacy almost, uh, almost down. And with the smartphone, you can almost have instant access to the world's information. That's something we haven't happened before. And this has happened in less than a short 20 years or so since the invention of the internet. As for me, it's an exciting time to be alive. It's an exciting time to see the philosophies of uh, capitalism grow. And of course, political freedom. <laughs> and I think the world is switching to it. And I'll go on now for the next rebuttal. Right. Uh, you want to usually go last, right, Charlie? Oh, I can wait. I was going to talk about Greta being in a sweatshop. Well, because Greta, Charlie, in a sweatshop, there's actually was more sweatshops under your socialistic idea on the farm where kids were, were okay. viewed as a source of labor. And now most of them go to school and have a childhood because of global capitalism. No, put her in school and let her learn a little more and grow up. Hi. Yes, hi. I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I love this free speech movement. Socrates talked about, you know, um, ask questions, inquiry. Um, I think that's what uh, is interesting. I, you know, I love, I love your talk. I agree with your social ideas. Um, I've learned a lot. I was raised by a Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, libertarian. Uh, you know, I'm, as if that's. The Bible, and um, because we're right. Actually, I was raised originally by a normal kind of Presbyterian family, and then my stepfather was that. And so, but it's interesting because what I learned is, you know, he was always right. I mean, it really is hard to argue, but it's only looking at kind of this set of facts, right? Whereas I, you know, I had another friend who would kind of give me more of this socialistic kind of social conscience view of the world um, and then I come here and you know we just slam it down it wouldn't work you know um, so it what concerns me is I don't think we'll get to agreement there's something called a vows chart where some people define everything by achievement and capitalism and other people define it by social kind of more social conscience and Actually, when I first went to the social conference, the International Socialist Organization has a conference here every year. I hope they'll continue, even though as an organization they've been somehow dissolved, uh, which concerns me. I, it was over somebody on the board doing sexual exploitation of somebody, which doesn't make sense for bringing down, you know, an international socialist organization. But uh, and the democratic socialists have replaced it. So I. I think what that's, that's kind of the problem is politics seems to be trumping reason, uh, you know, um, reason debate. I, I've d traced my ancestors back to the 1609, they came over, 1619 to Jamestown, and then 1639. The first governor and attorney general, you know, put out by the East India Company, but they really were they were looking for the new world, you know. They were 
looking to um, employ things. They, that was the year of the first slave, but they also had some trials of it. You know, there was, you know, they were inventing, you know, uh, they had a chance to kind of create this. Um, it's, there's a series, Jamestown, that does make some sense. You know, the Indians were negotiating for their rights and, um, and uh, you know, we, we do have to look at the big picture. It doesn't make sense to just look at the white man's view. Um, my stepfather, what woke me up is when he got taken by a honeypot scam, you know, by the Manhattan Institute a think tank that I realized really is a front group for the CIA, going back to Alan Dulles and James Burnham. And, and so, you know, I, whereas I believe in capitalism, what I realized was what we have is really financed by the, by the Nazis, basically. The CIA worked with the law firms um, and the international lawyers, the same ones that were putting in banana republics, uh, you know, Alan Dulles, to the Congo. I mean, talk about atrocities and dirty wars all over the world. We, the U.S., it, they're all client states. We put our bases all over there. And so we're really going for the Fourth Reich here. And I don't know anybody here. Does anybody here want the Fourth Reich? You do, I mean, if you could accept the truth of this. Okay, good for you. Maybe as long as they ask questions, right? right? Don't, no comments, only questions. Right? It's, um, it's absurd and, and, and scary because I, I also had a chance to see for, you know, head on is the war of Ayn Rand, you know, who's also up front for this. You think about Ryan, you know, the Rand Group and Oppenheimer, where my stepfather works. You, you see capital cities. There, these are all front groups for, a, you know, for this invisible empire. The Knights of Malta, the World Anti-Communist League, Reinhard Gellin and Carl Schmidt all work together with Alan Dulles to have this, and it's great because the. The Reich is invisible, we, you know, so we're going to be sitting here debating whether what's real and what's not real. Whereas, what that's my hope is if I can expose this through this promise system, you know, that this is like Big Brother, like George Orwell was talking about. They control Google and Facebook, they can spy on us, and they can erase, it's a cover-up of their wrongdoing. So every time Seymour Hirsch comes up with something, Robert Perry or or Danny Casalera was exposing this promise system that William Barr, our Attorney General, passed to Israel and they gave to the Russian, the KGB, so that they could have all our nuclear secrets. Basically, these bankers are financing both sides of all our elections, the Democrat, the Republican, the Communist versus the fascist dirty wars. You know, everywhere you go, they're making money dividing and conquering us. We can never come together and agree, let's solve climate change together because we've been atomized by our media. We're all just in this old yeah. little self, you know, ideology that we figured things out. And it, we, we have to be working with one version of history, one version of facts, and let's, let's get into solidarity and unity and work to solve this climate change problem. It's real. And I, those who, there's the propagandists that deny it, it discourages me because some very smart people will deny it. And uh, let's have a debate about it as we're going to have next week. And, but let's come to an agreement, okay? We should be able to agree if it's not false facts, this set of facts, and nobody is listening. We're only talking at each other. You can't agree when somebody you know is wrong. All right. All right, all right. Unfortunately, before we reach the point where we all work together on climate change, uh, which is something that oh, yeah. should be uh, at the top of our nation's uh, do, uh, do it and do it right away, we first have to recognize the fact that we in this country are pretty damn good. Look around here and you will find people with different names, different nationalities, <laughs> yes. whose ancestors had, in many cases, good reason for getting on a boat over here and getting on a boat, in some cases, 
very quickly. As one of my uh, relatives had to in the middle of the night when he was told by a policeman who knocked at his door and he said, Pat, you better get on the boat tonight because they're going to catch you in the morning and you're going to hang. So I'm here because he had the good sense to get out. We all come from backgrounds as, as diverse as you can imagine. This is to be enjoyed. This is to be worked upon because we each have a great deal of things that we each bring to the table. And yes, we can overcome the difficulties that we have today, even in the case of a very marginal president. <laughs> this too will pass. We will last long after that regime passes. And I frankly don't care if anyone from the KGB or whatever is listening because if I get locked up, I'm going to be with some very interesting people, uh, <laughs> including my congressman who said the same thing a few weeks ago. <clears throat> but anyway, um, quickly, we, we have a lot to work on, but first, we need to recognize the fact that we are not each other's enemies. We also need to recognize the fact that we seem to have a glamorized view of uh, other countries, other regimes, other revolutions. Earlier, it was pointed out that we had slavery, the French didn't. Nonsense. The French kept slaves. <coughs> Thomas Jefferson, when he went over to France, is our envoy uh, to France, brought along his slaves. <coughs> this is not something to be uh, uh, looked upon with pride, but it is something to point out that a lot of the world's evils did not originate in the United States. Remember, we Americans did not invent slavery. We Americans did not invent the pox. We Americans did not invent a number of other things which have uh, troubled this country for years. We can work together and we better work together because, look, climate change is a reality. Some of the best scientists in the world give us about 10 to 15 years before we uh, undergo some real changes that aren't going to be very pleasant. We still have time. But to do that, Mr. President, you need to call together a Manhattan Project, much as Franklin Roosevelt did during World War II. And you need to lock these guys in a room and say, gentlemen, you are not going to get out until you come to a solution, and until that solution can be implemented as quickly as possible. If that sounds draconian, it's no more draconian than some of the remedies which we have seen throughout history. For example, we can't agree here in this room on what is socialism. Uh, I was called a socialism simply because of the fact that uh, I uh, admire Franklin Roosevelt and I admire Teddy Roosevelt at the same time. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, that was considered a form of socialism. Uh, when I asked uh, this, this evening uh, what he would define as socialism, it brought on several other answers. We are at a crossroads in this country. Clearly, we can end up as a third world nightmare, or we can end up as a beacon to the rest of the world. And no, I am not running for president. Uh, but as a beacon to the rest of the world. But we have got to act now. And we have got to start acting like the person next to us is not our enemy. That the person next to us can be our ally, our friend, and indeed our co-worker. These are things that have to be done now. Not yesterday. Because I guarantee you, Unlike our forebears who came here to get away from rotten regimes, 
we aren't going to have any place to run when the you-know-what hits the fan. So let's start getting All serious. Right. Thank All you. right. And for president. <laughs> Jonathan! Jonathan! Jonathan. 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 Thanks, Sid. They claim to be super patriots, that they would destroy every liberty guaranteed by the Constitution. Which, incidentally, uh, capitalism is never mentioned in the Constitution, although you would think by a lot of speakers tonight it was uh, sacrosanct. They demand free enterprise, but are the spokespersons for monopoly and vested interest. And their final objective, toward which all their deceit is directed, is to capture political power so that using the power of the state and the power of the market simultaneously, they may keep the workers in internal subjection. That's Vice President Henry Wallace in April 9, 1944. Henry Wallace. So I think about uh, Henry Wallace's uh, warning to us all, and uh, we can't play into the hands of folks who want cannibalism with good PR to be the way. We have to stop using this word uh, capitalism and just call it what it is, greedism. Okay, because you really, you put yourself on, on a position where you got a trapdoor north, south, east, and west of you when you call it capitalism. That sounds sort of legitimate. Uh, defang it. You know, don't let it have this mythic uh, status that people love to surround it with who happen to always uh, not have been underneath those bombs dropping on your community. Not happen to be someone with a disability. Not happen to be in a, a disenfranchised community where there used to be a lot of factory jobs and now there ain't because people like Ronald Reagan got this crazy idea that it'll just trickle down someday for those folks. Which, I'm still waiting for that train to hit the station. It hasn't trickled down for me or my community. And uh, yeah, that's an American right to just call out something that didn't happen and be aware of the fact that it didn't trickle down. Okay, I can mention a whole list of other promises from capitalism, greedism. So a little history and now a little Hollywood. This is from Easy Rider, 1969, the campfire scene between Billy, George, and Wyatt, played by Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, and Peter Fonda. They're scared, man. They're scared. Well, they're not scared of you. They're scared of what you represent to them. Hey man, all we represent to them is somebody who needs a haircut. Oh no, what you represent to them is freedom. What the hell's wrong with freedom, man? That's what it's all about. Oh yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about, all right. But talking about it and being it, that's two different things. I mean, it's real hard to be free when you are bought and sold in the marketplace. Of course, don't ever tell anybody that they're not free, because they're going to get real busy killing and maiming to prove to you that they are. Oh yeah, they're going to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you about individual freedom. But if they see a free individual, it's going to scare them. Uh, don't make them running scared. No, it makes them dangerous. Eat, eat, meat, meat, swamp. <laughs> yeah, right. Swamp. And, uh, yeah, that was their promise, the promise uh, makers, uh, another promise that they, of course, did not keep. They're going to drain the swamp. Well, it's the swampiest it's ever been. I mean, they could literally rename it Drain the, the Trump now for the next candidates running for president because it's very swampy right now. So here's for all the swamp monsters. This is yours truly. Silver and gold for those who sell their principles. Stockholm Syndrome on steroids for the smartphone bread and circuses ghosts. Social order control on the eve of yet another bursting bubble. It's high school all over again. Who gets the car? Who gets to be broke? A new kind of Trojan horse on a corporate kingmaker TV show. But not we, not in 2020. We refuse to surrender our solidarity hearts. So we wrote this sucker punch drunk poem. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. When it's gone way off the flight path, gone way off the rails, gone way off the road, gone way off the sidewalk, way off the side trip, 
Way off the side roll, way off the soul, way off the all. There ain't nothing left but a strong surviving we the people's goal. And you want to say you don't want to go? Refused to in our sleep, the opposite of our chosen deed. You don't want to go? Refused in our dreams, the antithesis of solidarity. You don't want to go to that new day? Refused to on our knees, minimum wage, economic rope, choking our freedom. Never knowing autonomy, real adult soul with the youth yearn to reap. We don't want to joyfully leap over the cliff with the zombies. Rotten decoy from our voice, one of the people's so-called free lease. We refuse to donate to God's only happy when we are saber rattling, bomb tax and quackery. Well, now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank the speaker, and I would respectfully disagree with my communist friend. Uh, I. Uh, uh, in, uh, to, to focus on two uh, things that he said that sort of stuck out in my mind. Uh, was the first thing is he, uh, he uh, gave an example of the success of uh, China, communist China, as look at how many poor, of the poor that they've brought, people they brought out of poverty. Um, that started happening in, uh, I'm not sure if he'd agree with me, but I, I seem to recall the early 90s which was about the time that uh, China started introducing uh, capitalistic, some capitalistic practices. Um, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, okay, so the Chinese, before that, the Chinese were really, really poor. Well, who was in charge when they were really, really poor? Well, the communists. They took over in, what, 49? And uh, they had four years or so to figure things out, and they fell flat on their face. And then all of a sudden, they started implementing practices that for uh, decades now had been uh, demonizing. <coughs> and uh, I just think it's uh, myopic to uh, say that, uh, to imply that Chinese communism is an effective uh, economic model. Uh, the other example is he mentioned uh, as a great example of how well China is doing and how uh, humanistic they're doing is look at all the, how they're the number one builder of solar panels. Well, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, in, in, at the time I remember uh, there was a company um, that had uh, been given a huge subsidy in the United States to build solar panels. Solyndra. They went under, and the and the conservatives use it as an opportunity to attack wasteful spending by by uh, the Democrats. Um, but what nobody mentioned is that the reason that they went under is because they got buried by super super cheap solar panels from China. And so how were the Chinese like brilliant capitalists that had figured out how to make super super cheap solar panels? No was funded by the state. That's why they were so cheap, is because they were, it was, the, those they had solar panels, and they're still subsidized by the state. So that's why they're the number one uh, producer of solar panels, not because they're brilliant capitalists, but because China looks at it as an opportunity. Is that good for the world? Well, I'm not sure. Is it, I mean, it's great we have a lot of solar panels, but why can't they be made elsewhere? Why do they have to be dominated by that? Um, that country, um, and I would say that they would probably use that uh, domination for s strategic purposes to for their own self benefit. Um, I think that uh, I think that the basic flaw that I hear in a lot of these pro or anti uh, arguments between socialism and con uh, capitalism is that regardless of a person's viewpoint, what they tend to do is they tend to focus on the positive attributes of their position and the negative attributes of the other position. And there seems to be this black and white argument of the other side is bad and we're great. And uh, I just am, I, I'm against pure socialism and I'm against pure capitalism. Uh, pure socialism is communism. And that fell flat on its face to the detriment of hundreds of millions of people. Pure com capitalism was proven to us 150 years ago 
when you had the robber barons take over this country. Pure capitalism. How do you do it? You, you take you, the more power you get economically as as a business owner, the, the more power you have to put the, the little guy out of business, your competitor. If your dream is that all these small guys are going to start their businesses, it's not going to happen if you have a huge company who can do things cheaper than you. Walmart is the, is the biggest employer in this country, and they pay their employees poverty wages, and they import stuff from China, which is super cheap, and it's only going to last you two years, and you have to buy it all over again. And people are just too silly to understand it. Drive through Midwest country um, uh, counties in the Midwest, and you'll see these towns that are just boarded up because everybody goes to the Walmart. So, um, so me personally, I think that the, the, the goal is to try to find the right mix between capitalism and socialism with a utilitarian approach to benefit the most, but still giving people, cap capitalist companies, enough motivation to try to make money and be competitive. Thanks. Okay. Charlie. All right, I got to read both. Oh, just the right mix. Just, 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 just the right mix. Just the right mix. Just the right mix. This just gets to me. When the shit hits the fan, the shit is hitting the fan right now. It's going on. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm going to be 80 in April, so I'm not going to be around. But whatever's going on, there's. We're in transition right now, and there's going to be a lot of shit out there. It's pronounced male. Oh, 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 oh. See, that's part of the shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's global warming. <laughs> came down right there. Oh, is it the global warming? down in somebody's head. Okay, we're going to go. How do we get this back together? All right. Now we need to arrange this. I'm just Test. Test. You heard a crack in it. Turn it on. All right. Charlie, you want to go ahead? All right. All right, uh, so let's thank our speaker again. Nice presentation. Good to see him. Good to see him. Uh, it should be eclectic as usual. Talk about a number of themes. Just the right mix of capitalism and uh, labor creates all wealth. The capitalist doesn't do anything but creates the wealth created by others. And you think there's a right mix. Is that 10%? 25%? 50%? Oh, there's a right mix. Why should he get anything? He doesn't create any wealth. And he's, he's, the, whole, he's the right mix. Here's the right mix for the capitalist. You get zero. You don't need you. You don't do anything. There's no value added by the capitalist. There's absolutely none. All right, let's go on here. Regarding income tax, the only thing you need to know about income tax, I've heard a lot of do I did here tonight. The one thing about income tax, it was never applied to the extent that it was intended to at a rate of 73%. Yeah. Yeah. Every year it's yeah. gone down and it's never done it. Now, if you, if you had looked at the literature table in the back of the room for about several years now, I've been stocking this sheet regarding income tax. Um, put out by the War Sisters League, of which I am the current secretary of the Chicago chapter. So it's nice to come to the college and learn about income tax from a libertarian who never picked up one of these. Apparently, yes, no, 50% of the income tax goes for social services, domestic uh, programs, which benefit the seniors of the United States. And yet I heard tonight that the income tax only goes for to pay for war. Well, there's the pie chart. Pick one up, and read it, take it home, fold it up, put it in your pocket, take it off at nine to nine. 
You're entirely correct. And we'll move on here. Um, yes, in his history there, uh, civilization is basically city. City of ancient history for years, still do. Um, yes, there was the agrarian economy, and then you had the uh, diversification into trades or manufacturing uh, cottage industry in the cities, which was a type of evolution. I think you guys are talking about the same thing here. Now, to say that you need some sort of industrialization in order to implement capitalism, as Sid was talking about, is simply illogical. Uh, socialism takes place as a natural process in agrarian communities. I spent many years living in rural areas, and you have such as, you may have limited manufacturing or sources of supply. Everything I needed, I lived in an isolated community in the mountains, and everything I needed was in, of one type in the town. There was one grocery store and one pharmacy and one of these and one of those. And uh, it the, uh, balanced it with the rural economy of the area. Uh, so that, that's a symbiosis. That's why it's a hammer and a sickle. But you don't need, you don't need, you don't need Massachusetts clothing mills in order to have socialism in the United States. Matter of fact, that's why they passed the Constitution in 89, is because the people wanted too many freedoms, and they, they, they wanted to preserve property and wealth for the aristocracy, so they came up with this thing, the Constitution. That's why it's given an economic interpretation. They wanted to preserve it. And there was some talk there about the, the, the revolution. They wanted to put a cap on it. Uh, because it wasn't that coming like the French Revolution. Yeah, the rural areas, barn raising, co-ops, all sorts of cooperative activities you don't see in city communities uh, at all, what have you. Let's see what else. Uh, regarding uh, capitalism, capitalism has produces pollution. Um, it produces, and to say that, the technology of the capitalism, they're going to sell you a solution to the pollution they created. Uh, a technological solution. No, that's not the case. Uh, yeah, we just have a, that, that's like the, the Germans in World War II thought they were, they were trying to sell us there's some sort of wonder weapon that's going to win the war, right? Oh, yeah, we'll develop it, you know. It's called but there's just some technology. And the other thing I heard tonight, oh, Patrick, I feel so sorry for you. You can't understand what socialism is. You must go home and ponder this. It just means if you produce something, you get to keep it. And some other guy doesn't take the profit for himself. That's it's not, not difficult to understand. That's not what it means. When you manufacture, look, does it? Oh, you and the member rights. The 25 libertarian answers every night or something, you pull them out. Look at it. The capitalist does nothing. You, you, you take them out of the equation, okay. and the people share okay, it. Okay, Charlie, you Charlie. Know, Charlie. Do. All right. And the other day, no, I got time here. We've been here all night. I got one more thing about Greta. And I saw this video he sent around about Greta. And they're critical of Greta because the kids are concerned about what's going to happen to the the world, and it's going to, yeah, disintegrate. And the fire. capitalists, is, oh, they hate Greta. But you know what they would do with Greta? They'd put her in a sweatshop in Asia, making garments for uh, the Trump daughter there, 15 hours a day. That's what they would do with her. Now, what really saddened me about that damn video you sent around is the United Nations Association has things they call the Year of the Child. And there's a video about this whole that tells, that's the biggest indictment of capitalism I've ever seen. Critical of children when he doesn't realize, like the UN has a program, they had goals. One of their goals, if three goals or five goals, was that each child on earth would have one cup of food. But that motherfucker couldn't understand that. He didn't know that. And he just knows how to make fun of Greta and other children. You know, he just doesn't realize 
He doesn't know what's going on in child labor. Yes, he so does. On that no, he didn't want to talk about that in his goddamn video. Because child no, labor... No, that's what he did. He doesn't because care about Because child it. labor has been reduced yeah, uh, under yeah, capitalism. He's laughing at kids in there. There's that, more that people going to school in, now yeah, than ever, Charlie. Are you giving a talk, Tim? Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again. Right. Hey. Yeah. All right, Sid. All right, good. Go ahead and Rick. Wrap it up for us tonight. Okay. All right, Sid. Right back at him. Right back at him, Sid. Suck it, Tim. Tell me why I'm wrong, Sid. Tell me why I'm wrong. Charting the labor market. All right, Talk into the microphone. U.S. Labor, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, August the 2nd, 2019. U.S. life expectancy drops for three years in a row. Smithsonian Institute, 12-3-218. Around 40 million people are going hungry right now. It's charting the labor market, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, August the 2nd, 2019. So that's not important. And nobody looks at that. And then when you say it's not important that China brought half of its population out of poverty, that's not important. Get in the real world, man. All right, right Sid. Yes. Right. Love it, Sid. Love it, love it, love it. Good to have you yeah. back, Sid. We miss you. Yeah, you're a firebrand. Just like yeah. you're yeah. on the side yeah. of the 50s. Same guy. Okay. Had a good night tonight with everything else. Yeah. I hereby declare the college of complex adjourned yeah. until the next uh, <laughs> mysterious <laughs> we call the... Uh, Thank you, Tim. Yes. Get out of the stage. Is this called? Yeah, I'm gonna get that one.